Ever wondered what the manager really says to his players at half time? That's f***ing s***. And it's not about f***ing tactics, it's about f***ing Which they've got f***ing more on the f***ing day. So f***ing get on with it. Premier Passions. Start tonight at 10.50 on BBC One. It's everything you always wanted to know about the beautiful game. A chance to help in the fight against crime. Now on BBC One with Nick Ross and Jill Dando. Good evening. Tonight, live, eight million detectives are joining forces across the United Kingdom to tackle some of Britain's most serious crimes. Just by watching, you're one of those detectives. Around a thousand people will call us in the next 45 minutes. On average, there'll be arrests in more than a third of the cases you're about to see. We have an appeal in the studio from a husband whose wife was killed by a hit-and-run driver. An emotional plea from a woman confronted by gunmen in her own home and by the father of a girl raped as she left a Christmas carol concert. Crime Watch tends to show crimes that most people are least likely to suffer from. Why? Well, because they're the hardest to detect. So don't imagine what follows happening to you. It's an armed robbery in someone's home. It took place in Kettering, Northamptonshire, four weeks ago today. The husband, who runs a joinery business, had unwisely kept a large amount of cash at home. From early in the morning, people notice something unusual. It's a set routine, really. I don't think of anything apart from getting to work. Just looking forward to my cup of tea. As I pulled into the car park, but found I couldn't get my usual space, and I just felt a bit miffed because of this bright red Mondeo. Two hours later, just before 9am, a policeman also noticed a bright red Ford. Something drew my attention to this Mondeo. The paintwork looked in very good condition, however, it had both of its wheel trims missing and it drove off up towards the town centre of Kettering. About two hours after that, the homeowner came back to his house on his way between his workshop and the bank. And that particular day, I came in at 11. I just popped in for a coffee. Only in there five minutes. No, I, I haven't got a fixed routine. Sometimes I don't come home at all. Depends how the day goes. After going through the mail, he quickly headed back to work. Across from the house is Hawthorne Road, and sometime that morning, a resident noticed two men cruising past in a red Mondeo. There you go. Top. I think we've done well between us what we've done, worked hard, and um, we've set ourselves goals and we've achieved them. When we bought it, it was as it was built, and we've completely renovated it. it and it's taken ten years, because we do most of it ourselves, because we enjoy doing it. As I walk towards the turning on the left, I saw a man walk around the corner quite slowly towards me. I could clearly see that he had a gold sovereign type ring on the first finger of his right hand. My initial thoughts when I looked at him was that he was some kind of gangster. Who was the man with the mobile? And was he connected with what happened next? Don't move. Where's the money? Where's the money? It was their masks as much as the guns that were intimidating. Just seeing that those masks, I just blanked. 
Like when children cover their eyes up and think you can't see them. I just blanked. The one with the gun did most of the talking. Very calm and spoke very quietly. He didn't raise his voice. Very firm. I knew I'd got to do as I was told. The, the other one got quite nasty sometimes. Here you are. We won't hurt you. Keys! Where are the keys to the lock room? They're in there. It, it all took about 20 minutes, I suppose. <gasps> the one with the gun kept saying he wasn't going to hurt me, which I thought was rather ludicrous with a gun at your neck. I I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to hurt you. That's it, we're finished. Tie her up. I've done it. I'm going to lock you in and we'll phone the police. Don't do anything silly. Having tied her up with tape, the three robbers left. It was sometime before 1pm. I was driving downhill from London roads and I immediately took a turn left into Piper's Hill roads. I noticed two men came out of the side gate, behaving suspiciously. They both had dark complexions, uh, dark curly hair, dark eyes, and quite an orange colour of skin. They looked distinctly North African to me. The two men walked down Piper's Hill Road and back onto London Road. I came out the house, I looked down the road and saw two men, one running, one walking, and uh, realised I'd seen them before earlier on in the day in a red Mondeo, and I had this feeling that something wasn't quite right, because I did feel quite scared. So it was only a matter of minutes and I spotted a red Mondeo come down the road again, with this white passenger talking to people in the back. She was locked in for an hour and a half with her shouts unheard. Help me! Eventually, Help! by chance, her husband Help! looked in again. I'm up here! What is it? Help! I'm locked in! Get me out! Why? We've had an armed robbery! Thank God! It was shock and anger, really, when I saw her in that state. Um, I was just so angry, it was un unbelievable. These guys are absolute cowards. You know, to come in and take a gun in and, and threaten a woman, they are cowards. I'm usually the one that's in control, and now I'm not, and I don't like it. But I, I loved this house, I really did, but, but it made me feel that I just didn't want to stay here anymore. I don't know now whether I ever will. Paul Thor, let's first establish the family doesn't keep money in the house anymore. Absolutely not. That was a family nest egg. The money wasn't insured. And since that incident, the family don't keep any money on the premises at all. Presumably, the robbers couldn't have expected so many witnesses to see their car, this bright red Mondeo. And everybody says it was bright red, mm. sort of showroom condition, a saloon, not a hatchback. Did it belong to one of the robbers? Was it stolen? We have every reason to believe at the moment that that vehicle was in the possession legitimately, one way or another, of the people that were in it on that day. Do you know the registration or any part of it? Yeah, various witnesses have come forward saying it was either an M or an N registered vehicle, but we do believe it to be M registered. The two EFITs we were shown, these sort of North African looking people generally, do you know anything more about them? No, I'd just like to reiterate on that. They're both described as North African in appearance, one about five foot six tall, one about five foot ten, with the shorter having a goatee beard and wearing a green baseball cap. Quite a height difference between them. Yes. The, the guy with the uh, mobile phone, also seen outside the house, yes. of course it could be completely unconnected with the crime. 
Absolutely. Um, he may be just an innocent passerby, and I would appeal to him if he is watching tonight, and he is an innocent passerby, to ring in so we can eliminate him from our inquiries. I gather that there's a prospect you might know the name of one of the attackers. Yeah, bearing in mind the distressed state that obviously the victim was in, but she does recall one of the offenders being referred to possibly as Sean or John during the incident. Now you've brought some drawn knobs, as it were. These, these are sort of cut glass knobs. What's the significance of those? The significance of those is that at the end of the robbery, after the lady had been bound and locked in the bathroom, these items were smashed off bedroom furnishings and taken away by the offenders. Why? Um, we believe that uh, they may well have thought that they'd left some form of evidence on them and uh, we would ask anybody that's been asked to dispose of those items or have found any in the street discarded to ring in this evening and uh, pass that information on to us. All right, thanks very much indeed. If you recognise those, you've found them. If you can help in any other way, 0500 600 600, free call number to the phones around me here with uh, detectives on the case and BBC researchers here. Or you can call the incident room on 01 536 534 826. That's 01 536 534 826. On New Year's Eve, Tina Thorne was getting out of a car near her home in Basildon in Essex when a blue Ford Escort zoomed past. It struck her and threw her 40 feet into the air. Tina died almost instantly. But the driver didn't stop. In fact, he nearly hit other people too. And the chances are that someone watching this programme tonight knows who killed Tina, knows who it was that left her husband and her three children in a terrible state. Well, her husband Mel is here tonight, along with the officer in charge. Mel, I know that obviously your emotions are still very raw. It happened only seven weeks ago. It's very difficult, but what can you tell us about that night? Well, we've been out the night and just a good evening. And um, we was going on to another party and it just turned into horror when I turned around and see this car hit my wife. Mm. And, uh, and then just callously drove away and left her there. What sort of person was Tina Mel? <coughs> she was a great person, very caring, you know, always always there for people. Certainly looked after handicapped people all, all, all the time I knew her, which was uh, 16 years. You know, she was very caring, very special. And she's left you and your three boys, Mitchell, Jack and Louie, 13, 11 and 8. Uh, must be awful for them as well. How are they coping? They're, they're, they're coping in different ways. They're upset. Um, you know, they keep coming to me upset, um, asking me questions, crying. Mm. Yeah. Last night my little one came down asking me, you know, why I was mum and why wasn't she coming home and I had to explain to her, you know, that she was dead now. And, oh. and then I was thinking, why am I having this conversation, you know, and it's because this driver hasn't come forward. What would you say to him if he's watching or someone who knows who it was? What would you say to them tonight? Well, if anybody does know him, I'm sure somebody does then, you know, it's, it's time to come forward and um, so that we can rebuild our lives, get things going. Well, thanks for having the strength to come in to say that. Thank, Thank you. you. Police have put an awful lot of resources into this. Uh, full superintendent on the case, David Bright, you're determined to catch this man. Full appeal tonight. There's a reward for him. I suppose he decides, look, the most sensible thing is, even after this time, to hand himself in, to go to a police station tonight. What's going to happen to him? Well, that would be the best thing he could possibly do. Uh, and if he gives himself up, he will be treated uh, just as any other person in a similar situation. He'll be interviewed and the judicial process would be uh, undertaken. But more importantly, uh, it would bring relief to Mr Thorne and the three young boys who are living in hell at this moment. You're pretty confident he can't have kept this to himself, I, I know. You think he'll have told other people, other people will know about it. Now why? I th I'm confident that the, the offending driver must have known he'd been involved in the collision, must have known he'd struck uh, Tina, and I can't imagine how anybody could live with that uh, on their conscience for this period of time now. You've got an EFIT, and actually it's not a bad one. Uh, the EFIT I would describe as excellent. It is an excellent uh, likeness of the offending driver, and that was prepared by another motorist whom uh, the driver of the blue escort car nearly collided with after the accident with Tina. It, and he was driving a blue escort K, L or M registered, do you think? That is what we're led to believe, yes. Okay, and there are other witnesses you still want to get, because he nearly hit some other people as well. Uh, just prior to the accident, uh, when Mrs Thorne was struck, he nearly collided with a group of four people who were crossing Whitmore Way to go to the Fryans Community Centre. One of that group had to jump literally for their life. This is about 1.20 in the morning, New Year's Day. Mel, if he's watching, or indeed if friends of his are watching know who it is, they, they might say, look, you can't bring Tina back. What good will be served by him coming forward now? I can then turn around and say to my boys that justice has been carried out and that the person who killed their mother has been caught 
and we can then start to rebuild our life like we need to do. But all the time is out there, we can't. Okay. Well, please don't hesitate. If you know who this was, or if you've got suspicions. Yeah, and if it was you, you're much better off coming forward than being caught. The number here is 0500 600 600 or the incident room on 01245 452120. That's 01245 452120. And now here's Detective Constable Jackie Hames. I've got two men who went to the bank to have their pictures taken. The first turned up with a stolen cheque in Romford, Essex, but the cashier wasn't going to be fooled and she quickly contacted the police. Eventually the con man lost his nerve and turned to leave. He's in his 40s or 50s, 5 foot 10 with brown ginger hair. You can't ask for better pictures than these, so 0500 600 600 or you can call 01708 779 140. That's Romford 779 140. Imagine how upset you'd be if, while travelling on a train, someone stole your wallet or handbag. Maybe if you can identify this man, you can put a stop to a lot of misery. Here he is in a bank in Stamford Hill, London. He's cashing a cheque stolen from someone's jacket on a train journey between London and Northamptonshire. Next day, another bank, another cheque, but the same man. And then again, day three. In June, yet another dig into the victim's bank account. If you know who this man is, ring us now, 0500 600 600 or 0345 660588. That's local rate, 0345 660588. I can tell there have been nine arrests since last month's crime, much including three for murder, most as a direct result of calls by viewers. Two men were taken into custody on the night of the programme. One gave himself up at a police station, the other was arrested in Bristol. News on Kate Bushell, the schoolgirl murdered in Exeter in November. We had just over 300 calls, largely giving sightings of vagrants and a blue car seen in a nearby lane. And we'll give you more details on that case when we can. There's been a lot of activity since our reconstruction of an astonishingly detailed sighting after the rape of a child in Primrose Valley in Leeds. 150 viewers rang in, 20 thought they could identify the vehicle, and several men are now being asked to provide samples. The bizarre robbery at Aylesford in Kent produced 150 calls and quite a few interesting leads. One caller in particular asked to speak to D.I. Anne Britton. Now, he didn't leave his full details, but if that viewer cares to call back, he might be in line for a massive reward. And the number to ring is 01622 654 753. That's Maidstone 654 753. Now, as we so often say, violent crimes are relatively rare and serious sex offences against strangers are rarer still, but they cause huge distress and they're amongst the most important crimes to stop. In this case, an attack on a schoolgirl before Christmas caused outrage in the national press and, as you can imagine, awful grief in private. But there are several clues to go on, especially if you were near Harlow in Essex on Thursday, December the 11th. There you go, how's that? That looks great. If my mum saw me doing this, she'd have me decorating the whole house. Yeah, I know. The singing decorators. <laughs> that looks lovely, girls. Do you want to get something to eat? Give me an A. La. B sharp. La. C. Stop! Congratulations, you're in the choir. She was very much looking forward to Christmas and, uh, you know, being with the family and friends. And uh, she was looking forward to performing in a concert with her friends. I went my usual way home, right along the path which runs alongside First Avenue, and I saw a man sitting in the bus stop. I became aware he was looking at me. He turned his head and looked in my direction. He was aged about 20, medium build. He was wearing a black woolly hat which had a turn up of about two inches. I could see he was smoking, I could smell the tobacco. I walked about 25 yards, then turned round to have another look. 
but he had gone. I couldn't see which direction he'd gone in. The interval began at around 8.40 and most people were expected to stay. Hi, are you off? Yeah, I've been given permission to leave early. Okay, see you tomorrow then. Okay, bye. Bye. The reason that she left the concert early was because her friend had left earlier who was upset and she wanted to see if there was anything she could do to help. Um, so she didn't have a coat or anything. We were supposed to pick her up from the concert, but the friend didn't live that far away, and I think she hoped she could visit and make sure they were okay and get back again. We've always uh, been very protective of her, in, and this was in actual fact the first time that she'd ever been anywhere alone at night. I decided it was time to take the dog for his walk. And uh, a chap passed me on the footpath, was a tallish, six foot, slim built, thin features, wearing dark clothing. I looked back and I, I could actually still see the bloke silhouetted against the skyline. She, she screamed and she tried very hard to fight him off, but he threatened to kill her if she didn't stop making a noise and fighting him. I feel quite helpless in some respects because I, I, <coughs> there's no, nothing I can do to take away the pain or the trauma that she's gone through. It's now approaching nine o'clock. I was driving along First Avenue and there was a car indicated left up Mumples Road and I noticed a man coming off of the edge of the field. He ran to the middle of the road and then he had to step back because obviously there was a car coming in the opposite direction. Then two or three minutes further on... I was driving along London Road, just get up to the last speed hump this man was running towards me and the clothes he had on was very unusual. He wasn't in jogging attire or anything like that. It just looked very, very unusual why someone should be running that speed at that time of night. In the morning she was on top of the world looking forward to the concert. And then afterwards, well, she was like a totally different person, a totally different person. I suppose I feel that I failed. I think, you know, my wife and I did everything possible that we could do. But at the end of the day, she was attacked and, you know, we weren't, I wasn't there to prevent it. I just wish I had been. Well, Terry Gardner, how can you describe this? I mean, it's a despicable crime. It's an extremely nasty crime. The victim is a 15 year old schoolgirl. She has suffered tremendous trauma, as of course uh, her family as well. So what do you know about the attacker then? Well we know that he's a white male, he's aged somewhere between 20 and 30. He's about 6 feet to 6 feet 2 inches tall, slim build, and he was wearing a dark puffer style jacket, dark trousers and a black woolly hat with red writing and of course a stock and mask. Now this is the victim's description of him. There yes. was a, a sighting of another man resembling this sort of description at the bus stop that we saw in the film. Yes there was, uh, and that description 
is very, very similar to the victims. And the, of course, the e-fit is of the man at the bus stop. Now, the e-fit shows a sort of a rough, rather rough woolly hat, but you say it was more like this, really, a sort yes, of smooth... Yes, it's a, a much smoother material with red writing on the front, which is either an A or an M and a motif underneath. Now, as we saw in the film, we heard from a woman who said that a car or two in front of her almost hit a man running across First Avenue. Um, you haven't heard from that driver, have you? No, we haven't. We understand there were three, three cars very near to the lady that we've spoken to, and none of those have come forward, and we're sure they must have seen the man, and if they did, we'd like him to ring us. What about the other sighting, the final sighting of him? Well, the last sighting we had of a man of the same description was running down London Road towards Old Harlow, and we're not sure whether he went down a little alleyway or continued on the main road down to Old Harlow, but we'd urge people if they saw him to ring us if they saw him in that road. Do you think he's local? Well, we, we tend to think he is. Obviously, we're not going to put all our eggs in one basket and say he is, but our feeling is that yes, probably is. Now, you have forensic evidence, so you can easily eliminate those who, who, who aren't the man, who isn't the man, can't you? Yes, I, I would urge people out there tonight who are watching this programme, if they've got any information whatsoever, if they think they know who the man is, please ring us. We can eliminate people very easily because of the forensic evidence. We can do it quickly, we can do it easily and very discreetly. Please ring us. Absolutely. Well, we'll echo that. Terry Gardner, thank you very much indeed. 0500 600 600. Even if it's only a suspicion, don't please take the chance that another girl might be put through that ordeal. That's our free call number direct here to the studio. And here's the incident room where other detectives are waiting by the phones. That's on 01245 452120. That's 01245 452120. Now here is DC Jackie Haynes again. Now a rather crude offence, actually a rather crude forgery. It was so ineptly done that bank staff instantly activated security procedures when this man paid in a cheque. So at least we've got these pictures. Who is he? Incidentally, the cheque had originally been stolen from someone's mail. So if you know who this is, please call us on 0500 600 600 or 01483 531111. That's Guildford, 531111. Now, a face to watch for if you're thinking of renting a flat. Neil Forbes Pringle is 30, though some of these pictures were taken some time back. Police hold warrants for his arrest in connection with a number of property frauds where people have lost deposits on flats. You may have seen him in Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Glasgow, Nottingham, Northampton or Bournemouth. 0500 600 600, live here to the studio or 01224 716 741. That's Aberdeen 716 741. You may recall a reconstruction from 18 months ago. A taxi driver in Leicestershire, Danny Marlowe, had been receiving mysterious telephone calls and told friends he was being followed. He was then found run over in the street. Our two men have now been charged with murder. Those charges weren't as a direct result of Crime Watch. Our next arrest was, and it's a remarkable one. A viewer remembered a Crime Watch appeal for 15 months and then recognised a man in Spain. Detectives from Merseyside went out and arrested him. He's now been sentenced to 10 years imprisonment for serious sexual offences against a child. Three names, the four calls, three names. Well, a lot of response so far. We've had 22 calls on the Kettering aggravated burglary. An overwhelming response on the uh, Basildon hit and run. 23 calls, 10 names, two callers, interesting, hopefully, hopefully, uh, name the same person. Romford attempted deception, four calls so far, but three callers have named the same person. On the NatWest check deceiver, two calls, one name so far. So a lot happening already tonight. Earlier this month, a 16-year-old boy was attacked at knife point. He was robbed and subjected to a very serious sexual assault by a man on a train in the south of England. He was so traumatised he couldn't speak about it for almost two days. But police have managed to find some pictures. Now they think this man may have vital information. The boy had boarded the London-bound Victoria train at Eastbourne at four in the afternoon on Saturday, February the 7th. That's two weekends ago. This man was also on that train. This is him at Eastbourne station. Now, look carefully at him. He's around five feet ten. He's in his mid-twenties. He's in an athletic build, and we think he had a Jamaican accent. If you know him, you'll recall that his upper left tooth is silver. And notice his baseball cap. It's an unusual design called a Drew Pearson. It's similar to this one. Did you see him at the station? Did you see him on the train? Or did you see him get off, perhaps at Clapham Junction or East Croydon? Now, if he looks familiar, or if it is you, please call us right away, 0500 600 600, or 0171 387 0354. That's British Transport Police, 0171 387 
0344-0354-0354. Millions of pounds are spent each year on security cameras, and you might expect they'd be excellent value for money. But it's depressing how poor the images often are, and disappointing when the recordings come from professionally installed closed circuit systems in banks. Even so, our next villain has been surprisingly lucky. He's mounted at least 14 attacks, terrifying staff, but not clearly been identified in any of the tapes. But put all these Im images together, though, and someone must know who he is. The first is in Rugby, in Warwickshire, about two years ago. This is a Friday morning in May, the start of a pattern of attacks that are almost always just after 10am. A month later, midweek this time, but again just after 10, again he's carrying a plastic Iceland carrier bag. This is Hinckley. Is he a professional driver who visits the Midlands once a month? Then another month, another drive north, this time Colville. These are quite good pictures of him, and notice his cap. He's failed to intimidate the cashier, and he's leaving empty-handed. Now a two-month break till September 1996, and south to Leamington Spa. Notice the kids playing as the gunman stands in line. This is a man prepared to put children at risk of what could become a frightening panic. Next, on to Stratford-upon-Avon. He's videoed in a post office just before he attacked a nearby bank. Then October, and on to Loughborough. Is he a local man with no commitments on a Wednesday or Thursday morning, or is he taking time off work? Now December 1996, and Burton-on-Trent. Watch his walk, a slight waddle, or maybe it's a limp. Next, mid-January 1997, and on to Bromsgrove. After this, a gap for a month, so now it's March, and this is Litchfield. He shows the cashier the barrel of a gun. April, and a bank in Stafford. This time the gunman's pictured outside the bank, and here he is without his cap and glasses. But look carefully at him now. He seems to be getting thinner. Compare this with his paunchy jowls nine months previously. Is he on an unusually effective diet, or is he ill? Last July, he was foiled at a raid in Kenilworth, and instead of giving up, he drove straight on to Bridgenorth in Shropshire, and he seemed to show frayed nerves. In fact, after the next raid in Melton Mowbray, the sequence stops. What happened to him after his last robbery in August? Where did he go? And where is he now? If you know who he is, please give us a call right now. 0500 600 600 or call Operation Whirlwind, based in Warwick. Detectives are there on 01926 415 995. That's Warwick, 415 995. Now here's DC Jackie Holmes. With three wanted faces. First, this man, Richard John Ramsey Burrows, was released on bail pending trial on 11 charges of indecent assault and buggery. He failed to turn up and there's a warrant for his arrest. He's 53 years old with receding hair, fairly short at 5 foot 6. He's a radio ham, surfs the internet and is known to like boats and barges. He may be on a canal somewhere, in fact he was seen on one in the Warwickshire area in January. He could be a threat to children anywhere. If you've seen him, call us right away on 0500 600 600 or 01244 614 713. That's Chester 614 713. And another man who's done a bunk, this time a prisoner. He's David Burgess, aged 50, 6 foot 1, heavy build and wears glasses. He has scars on his lips and tattoos on his left arm of an eagle and the name Dave. In the past, he's served time for murder, but more recently was convicted of fraud. He was out of prison on licence in October 1996, but failed to return. If you've seen him, do give us a ring and tell us where he is tonight. On 0500 600 600 or 01275 816. 6776. That's 01275 816 776. And this man too is wanted on warrant. He's smiling here, but he's been charged with a crime in which a victim was hit on the head with a hammer, had his hair set alight, hot water thrown over him, and cigarettes stabbed out in his face. Terry Hill is 27, 5 foot 10, has a Yorkshire accent and a scar on his nose. If you've any idea where he is or if you've got anything to tell us, please don't sleep on it. Call now. 0500 600 600 or 01302 385 661. That's Doncaster 385 661. <coughs> 
Now to the seaside, to Brighton, Sussex, and the scene of an armed robbery. There's a most unusual feature to this crime. A man who arrives before the attack and leaves soon after. Now he could be quite innocent, but to detectives there's bound to be a niggling doubt until this crucial passerby can be eliminated. Now these are some of the rings that we've got. They're all hallmarked. They could be made to order. That one's aquamarine. This one's nice. This one's with a setting slightly to the side. Right, that's fine. Band. Diamond ring with a wishbone setting. We do manufacture a lot of the, the more expensive pieces that we sell, our own production. Um, it's all done on the premises by our own people. This is where our strengths are, that we're not just a normal retail shop. Oh, this Madonna pendant. On Wednesday, the 19th of November, at about ten past four in the afternoon, a blue cavalier drove into the Lanes area of Brighton and parked right outside a jeweller's known as Gold Arts in Brighton Place. The driver walked up Meeting House Lane, which runs beside the jewellers. Twenty minutes later, with the Cavalier still there, three men emerged up Brighton Place, heading towards Gold Arts. At the same time, the driver of the Cavalier returned to his car and opened up, but didn't drive away. Behind him, in Meeting House Lane, a mother and daughter were window shopping. What do you think of those rings? Do you think Auntie Lucy would like one for Christmas? They were heading for the home furnishings shop just opposite Gold Arts. They just looked suspicious, hanging round. One of them looked straight at me, and I got a good look at him. The man was more than six feet tall, lean build with broad shoulders, dark skinned, with dark chin length hair in a neat dreadlock style. He looked about 25, 35 years old. Get down and you! Down! Get down and stay down! Okay, okay, okay. okay. You shut up! Show me your hands! Show me your hands! Get down! Open these. Get them open. I was concerned, particularly for the female members of staff. They were getting quite anxious. Shut up! Stay down, you! At the time, you think that uh, it's going on forever, but in real terms, I don't suppose it was any more than a minute or two. I heard raised male voices and I could see black leather glove clad hands in the window display sweeping the jewellery out of the Where's the cat? You! Where's the cat? There is no cat! Where is it? Stay where you are, don't look up! Down. The Cavalier had now turned round and drove off as the men emerged. It may have been pure coincidence, but who was the driver? Is everybody okay? Don't touch anything. I'll phone the police. Just seeing somebody walk past the shop with a crash helmet on has had the effect of uh, making them very nervy, very jumpy. Um, noises at one time, the gunman cocked the gun and um, that click was quite distinctive and that's something else, if there's a click or something for some reason happens then uh, it sort of brings it all back. Outside, the robbers drew attention to themselves. Well, the first one just looked very odd because he was so huddled in appearance and he was very close to the wall and, and very keen not to have eye contact with anybody. The second guy passed me, he still had his helmet on, which I thought was really odd. I normally arrive to pick the wife up from work every evening. On this specific day, I arrived early for some oh, reason, 
and it was too early to go home. Sorry, on now, it's crap back here. Lovely and warm. Come on, Dad, let's have some Christmas. No, it's too early. Oh, it's too early. Oh, no. oh, oh, Will you God. stop oh. mucking about? It looked very suspicious the way they was running. They were in a great hurry to get away. And I knew that something had gone wrong somewhere around the corner. The three sprinted down Black Lion Street to Brighton's seafront. Where'd they go after that? Okay, well, Mark Thompson, where could they have gone? Well, that's something we're obviously trying to establish, Jill. Um, they could have gone to a car park at the bottom of Black Lion Street, some public toilets there, or straight down onto the seafront. Now, you've got a few clues as to the identity of these men, haven't you? Yes, we've a good description of the gunman. He's described as being uh, of mixed race, uh, over six foot tall, with what's described as oh, yes. uh, black dreadlock-style hair. He was wearing black motorcycling clothing and a white crash helmet. What about his two accomplices? What do you know about them? We don't know so much, however, uh, one of them wore a dark blue Royal Mail-type jacket um, and was about five foot ten. Uh, he was white uh, and the other one was uh, in his mid-twenties wearing a beige jacket and of average height. So does anyone know a gang of three who hang around together answering those descriptions, really? Indeed. Now, the bag that they used to take away their haul, again, was quite distinctive. It may give a few clues. Yes, it was. It was uh, a red bag similar to this one uh, with white piping. Uh, around it, uh, about three foot long and of a sports type hold all appearance. Right. Now this mysterious blue cavalier is giving you a few problems, isn't it? It is. Uh, obviously it's a car that was there at the material time um, and we would like to eliminate the driver okay. of it from our inquiries. Now we don't know who that person is, um, but obviously the car was a dark blue cavalier uh, on an L prefix. They stole what, £100,000 worth of jewellery? Yes, that's right, it, or in, it, in it excess of, uh, in fact, uh, very distinctive. Lots of it had the GA uh, lettering on it as a hallmark, peculiar to the shop, uh, and um, there are some distinctive pieces. So obviously if you're offered anything like this, be wary and certainly call the police, because there are a few pieces like this around, aren't there? Indeed so. Now, it was a vicious burglary. There is an incentive, isn't there, for people? There is. It was a ferocious attack, which obviously traumatised the staff. Uh, there is a £10,000 reward being offered for information leading to a conviction. Now, of course, it was more than a burglary, it was a robbery. So, Correct. Mark, yes. thank you very much indeed. Now, if you know who was involved or if you recognise anything, call us right Holy away. Two. This is live through to the studio. Calls are free, as we've said, 0500 600 600. Or call the incident room on 01273 665564. That's Brighton, 665564. Not a huge volume of calls tonight, but what we're getting, well, they're really good. I've just had a very interesting one on Operation Whirlwind. That's the middle-aged man who was doing that series of robberies around uh, the Midlands. This looks really interesting indeed. On the Kettering aggravated burglary, now eight names put forward, and the Basel and Hit and Run, a tremendous response. That's just here. We haven't checked with the incident room there yet on that one. And maybe tonight we'll get a call that will stop a terrifying series of attacks in North London. In the last four months, there have been at least seven sexual assaults on women in and around Highgate Tube Station. On one day alone, a Tuesday morning last October, there were four offences, one a few minutes before this sequence and three soon afterwards. Police need to trace this man. He's over six foot tall, late twenties and athletic, with a build described as like a boxer. Whoever is doing the attack seems to revel in scaring women. He attacked one of his victims twice and he has to be caught before something even worse happens. 0500 600 600 or call 0181 340 1212. 0181 340 1212. Now for a crime you may think opportunistic, but this is the sixth time it's happened. Now this is Guildford in Surrey about five months ago. As you can see, there's a delivery to one of the shops in the High Street. Now watch what happens while the van driver is inside the store. Two men approach and steal armfuls of clothes and then they split up before making off. Now, now these are good pictures. They come from Guildford's closed circuit television system. If you think you know these thieves, don't keep it to yourself, please. 0500 600 600 or 01483 531111. That's Guildford 531111. Our lines are open here in the studio for well over an hour and a half. We'll be taking calls till midnight and you'll see other numbers in a moment. They're also listed on CFAX on page 621. If you're online, you can email us at crimewatchuk at the BBC. That's cwuk at bbc.co.uk. And all information on appeals will be sent on to the police. 
And if you've information on a crime we haven't covered, call Crime Stoppers 0800 555 one. We'll be back with Crime Watch Update at 20 to 12, and I hope we'll have a great deal more to tell you then. If you can't stay up that late, do, do join us next month, Tuesday, March the 24th, and watch out for two powerful reconstructions of how Crime Watch calls have helped crack major police inquiries. Crime Watch Manhunt is at 10 o'clock on Wednesday the 11th of March, and Dreams of Gold at the same time on Wednesday the 18th of March. They're both very, very powerful films. Calls to Crime Watch work, so don't worry, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night. Alive with community spirit. People here. Life's not easy. Never has been. I'm going to stay with them till they're heard. Reconciling public duties. I wanted you to know how sorry I am about your daughter. With personal dilemmas. You should get out a bit more. That's an invitation. I still love you. Testing times for Rachel in Mortimer's Law. Friday at 9.30 on BBC One. All in a day's work. Football might have been their first love, Get in the air! but it certainly wasn't their last. Go ring your girlfriend, tell her to bring her vibrator around. I want my own vibrator, thanks. Oh, you probably didn't hear it though. You were asleep at the time. But we're not even married. That's right, you're not. Ah! Don't touch me. Don't come near me ever again. I'm not proud of what I did, but I'm just a human being. Playing the field starts Sunday, March the 8th on BBC One. Yes! Topping the Premier League now on BBC One, a brand new series. Strong passion, strong language and tension in the dressing room. All for the love of Sunderland. It all began back in spring 95. Sunderland Football Club were facing relegation into the second division. A team who had twice won the FA Cup had hit rock bottom 